on to this session of buyer seller round table bridging the expectation gap the moderator of the session is mr gunjan jain vkc nuts may I request all of you who are gathered here to give a big round of applause in welcoming mr gunjan jain joining him on the panel is mr kalbavi prakash rao of kalbavi cashews mr santosh arogiraj of tamil nadu cashew processors and exporters association Sri Prabhu Shankar Agarwal Ji from Haldiram, Ujjwala, Kolkata. Mr. Srinath Chaudhary from ITC Limited, and he would be joined by Mr. Dilip Mohanty from Reliance Retail. I beg your pardon. It is uh, Mr. Satish Aragiraj. Uh, I made a mistake. A very good morning to all. So I have been requested to moderate the session on bridging the expectation gaps between the buyer and the seller. For cashews, I don't think uh, it's a task that can ever be done. You can never bridge all the expectation gaps between a buyer and seller. They will always be there and because they are there. That is why uh, the trade happens. But what we have to do is make them as short as possible. Whatever can be done, we we'll bring it together. So I just before getting into it, I'll give you the uh, just a brief on the Indian cashew market as such, where we are. I think most of the people here know India is the largest producer, processor, and consumer of cashews in the world. We cover about uh, 0.7 million hectares of area and uh, 0.4 million uh, metric tons of production. We account for about 15% of the world cashew exports. The way, one thing which has to be seen is uh, the, there's been a break in the trend this year that. Earlier every year the Indian cashew exports were declining, but for the first time it's again looking to go up. What that means is that uh, with the 7% growth that has come, we are looking again that there should be a 4-5% to growth in the overall category of cashew nuts for India. So on Indian cashew consumption, largest consumer of cashew nut kernels in the world, we account for 25% of the overall consumption. And mind you, this is to understand that when uh, it is being said, the, the still the thing, the mindset of an average Indian consumer is cashew is not as healthy as other nuts. So I keep saying this to the people around the world: if the Indian cashew industry really starts working, and if we really, really promote on the health benefits of cashews, I don't think there will be any cashews left for anywhere else in the world. India will finish them all. India is the largest market when. Uh, they, it's not connoted that cashews are very healthy when they are as healthy as any other nut. In 2019, the consumption of cashew nuts was recorded at about 185,000 tons. It was slightly lower than the previous years and that was because of the COVID impact. COVID-19 had a slightly uh, negative impact on the consumption and that was uh, mainly on the snacking side of it. However, with increasing awareness of health benefits and uh, Overall, the moment that the consumer healthier segment is seen, I do feel that value-added cashews will see a change in the Indian market very soon. So the 2022 Indian market of cashews, how it was looking, whole cashews, uh, I've just put on some of the uh, main things. Gifting was on a downward trend post-COVID, but we're looking for a comeback. These are the reasons we feel that the cashew market should look up Snacking was downward, but again it should pick up. Marriages, everybody knows that there were no big, large, big fat Indian weddings, but that will change this year. One of the major factors was this year in whole cashews that big sizes, but the 180s, the 210s, uh, the 240s, there was very low premium as there was very low offering. That again should change with more brick and mortar getting in action, that again should change this year. We, you feel that you will see big, better demand coming in. I think that's good news for the processors here. On the broken cashews, Mithai initially was down but has picked up. Namkeen has been doing consistently well and that is what it will be. Organized ingredient demand is uh, getting bigger now and Shrinathi will talk more on it. Horeka was down but again picking up. Temple, which is in fact, uh, put it as a separate segment because it was really, I mean, it is a major consumer for cashew nuts in India, so it was down and slowly scaling up. So I've just put it to give you the context that how large is India. So if you look at it, Indian cashew consumption is almost twice the next big player, which is US, 
India is double. And if you look at the third player, India is six times. That's the size of the cash market in India. What are the mega trends, opportunities and risks on both the processor and buyer side? That's what we are talking about and how do we bridge these gaps? What are the changes that's happening in the industry? On scale, number one on the processor side, scale is becoming very relevant with more and more automation happening, uh, with more uh, machinery coming in. We are seeing now some players going into very large size and scale of manufacturing, we are doing very large facilities. Having said that, there is decentralization of supply, where earlier you were not seeing uh, processors in the non-traditional areas. Till now, a lot of processing was mainly limited to the traditional crop areas, but that's not so now. You can see a cashew facility in every nook and corner of the country. Basically, what is happening is now that uh, the supply chain gap is reducing because you have a you have a processor right where the market is at every corner. You have suppliers in the north in India. You have a lot of processing facilities now. There's an increased number of players than the traditional pit. Uh, I was just hearing somebody that every time. I mean, we get. Uh, I mean, we are seeing a lot more new players coming into the industry on the processor side. The connectivity between processor and consumer is getting closer, and I'll show that in the next slide. The volatility is there for the processor a lot. On one side, I mean, we are seeing because of the current supply chain challenges, shipment challenges. We are seeing RCM pricing going up. We are seeing supply challenges, not having the goods in time. But Indian market has not been responding so well, so there's a big uh, price volatility, the way the currency is moving. In terms of the trends that we are seeing on the consumer side, uh, there's a large channel diversification. Tech has really uh, done a very large play that uh, there's been a large disruption. We just saw the 10-minute quick commerce and stuff, so new channels have emerged. These channels didn't exist before, now these channels e-commerce, uh, quick commerce, these are also leading to a kind of a new consumer behavior. You would have a 15 year old, you would have had a 25 year old traditionally ordering for nuts and dried fruits in the household. It would have been the next generation, but that's the change we are seeing now. Supply chain, we are seeing because of e-commerce and stuff, it is, the penetration is getting better. You are able to move to tier 3, even tier 4 cities now have consumers for nuts. It was a classic chicken and egg that we used to have when uh, we were trying to get the consumer to try out new stuff. But now with the e-commerce and uh, the quick commerce, we are able to have people experiment more on those. Consumerism is at its peak. Rahulji showed us what the consumer, I mean, right now the consumer will put what they see immediately. There will be a picture and it will be down. The expectations of the consumers have really, really gone up what they are expecting from a processor, what they are expecting from a brand, from a product. And it is very vocal now, they are very easily able to manifest what their needs are. There has been a change in shifting occasion in terms of the consumer front. Earlier it used to be a very specific occasion-led uh, consumption. That is changing, we are seeing more consumption occasions coming in and that will cause a change. Competition, of course, is increasing on every end, whether it is uh, new players on the e-commerce segment, they are fighting, new retailers are fighting amongst each other, we as sellers to them are fighting, so I mean overall the competition is increasing. What all we have to understand is, right now the potential for this market to increase is so much. Satya mentioned on the per capita consumption. India is a bismillah you on the per capita consumption. So, when the per capita consumption increases, the size of the pie is going to be so much that all we need is healthy consumption, healthy competition, and we want the category to grow for all. So, that's the changing supply chain I wanted to see. So, initially, this was the supply chain. What has happened is that the supply chain has really shortened. It used to be the importer from the importer. There used to be a different importer of RCM. Then there was a processor. Then there was a trader. Then there was a distributor, a sub-distributor, a retailer and a consumer. Now what has happened is, the importer processor, it has also just, I mean, thinned out, it's just one. The importer is the processor now. There's a retailer speed and it goes, it goes to the consumer. So the supply chain is also, I mean, we're seeing a drastic change in the supply chain. So I'll now put it over to Mr. Prakash.
to talk about talk more about the interpretation between processes. Good morning to all of you. Gujarat has set it up nicely for us to understand or to bridge, uh, you know, the expectations of uh, the processes and the different market segments. So this is a celebrated fact now that Indian consumption. We are the largest consumer of the cashews in the world today at 285,000 metric tons. But what we really need to go down and see is what are the segments and how are they really performing. So the Horeca segment, which is the hotels, restaurant and the catering segment, this is really we are in an enviable position here. The world is looking at us for this particular segment. We are. This is of course a guesstimate from me and this is at 115,000 metric tons. This is substantial here. Confectionery and frozen desserts guesstimating again at 28,000 metric ton. The value addition of course is very small, but uh, I'm sure there's a lot of value addition that happens at the end, the retailer's end, and then to the consumer. And the snacking, which is uh, I think something that really is not growing as per our expectation, is 127,000 metric tons. So these are on the basis of our, you know, assumption that, not assumption, I think it's a fact now that we are doing 1.5 million tons in terms of processing. And out of that, uh, this is what I am able to estimate. So clearly, the ingredient segment is growing, is the fastest growing one, as we have seen. And uh, that's in spite of the fact that we've been, our broken availability has jumped from 25 to 40 percent because of our mechanization and automation plans. So we are losing very healthily in terms of consumption, uh, market consumption at 6 to 8 percent. I think that's very healthy for us. But the question is, is it really saturating? I always maintain that our exports are down not merely because of the Vietnamese competition, but it is because of our own inherent strength of our domestic market. So the moment we are able to satisfy the domestic market, if at all we can, I think our exports will once again bounce back. And last season and this season both, we have seen that bridge, you know, that uh, gap narrowing for W320 in exports and the domestic segment. It came down to 15, 20 rupees for a very brief while though, but I think with the processing, Increasing, I think the processing has gone up by almost 10% in the last two years. I think with the processing base expanding on account of mechanization and new plants, I am very sure that we are getting into back into the export mode again. So what we need, really need to do is take a closer look at all the market segments and identify the gaps and let's see whether we can see what we can do about it next. So the three market segments, I think Gujan has also talked about this. This is a the GT, the general trade, which I think is 65% of the trade that happens in the Kirana shops or the, you know, the mom and pop shop, or the retailers basically, the mandis as we call them. The organized retail or the modern retail as many will call it is about 15%. That has been growing very healthily. The end users, the institution, institutional sales, you know, the Haldiram, the Bikaner Wadas, and all those ITs and all those big companies, these are almost 15% of our, 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 our segment and the e-coms, the quick coms which are the new entrants are just about 5%. So if you look at, I am looking at each of these segments and seeing what their expectations are and at the end we will see how we can bridge them. So the expectation from the organized retail, well the manufacturer should be reasonably big size because these organized retail chains are really growing and they expect you to supply them continuously. And that's the reason they look at the reasonably uh, reasonably good capacity plan. The unit must have quality certification. Now this is a base, base and it should be GFS, Global Food Safety Initiative recognized. So uh, the ISO 22000 is no longer looked into it. Traceability is a big question. I think the uh, food safety team is absolutely a need now. You really need to know how to handle consumer complaints. You need to file those CAPAs which are corrective. Uh, you know, the preventive actions, uh, uh, the corrective and the preventive actions that you need to do on them. The ability of the market, uh, ability to manage the assortment. Now, this is very important because the buyers, this modern trade, do not understand what are your different grades, and it's really up to you to educate them and set your own assortment in the modern retail, so that you can you can really see the sales going up. So, industry must be must understand. This is very important. The TOT or the terms of trade of this uh, modern retail or the organized retail, you know, it will be, it will, you know, it's a sort of a barrier now for most of them to get into also. It could be the vendor registration charges, it could be the listing fees, the shelf fees, you know, the festival bonuses that we'll have to dole out, 
the another major clause that you will have to sign is return to vendor, which means they expect us to you know ensure that the, the cash will remain good for the entire shelf life. It's six months, eight months, one year, whatever you give. During that period, if there is any complaint on the cash use, you have to take it back, including the expiry. So, back-end costs, these are again something that they expect you to pay something on the entire turnover, a certain percentage. There are so many other costs that are involved, it's up to you to negotiate the TOTs. So, fixed cost pricing is something that they would like. They don't want you to keep changing the prices every day and they certainly don't like the MRP to change. They want a very stable MRP. If you are going to change the MRP, you will have to look at a product recall of the lower MRP. This is the biggest challenge, the door delivery. Now, this is an appointment based delivery. I think most of the people who are already doing this will find it an extremely tiresome job of delivering the goods to the modern retail. This is one of the major gaps which we have been raising at every forum. But I think it's a tough one. The fill ratios, their POs will come on every week and they expect you to service every single PO and maintain a very good fill ratios. OTP on time delivery is absolutely mandatory. They look at the lead time, how, how you manage your lead time. This is very, very critical for us. So, if you look at that as, a, as against a general trade, very easy to deal with. They just want good quality and they want, of course, cheap prices. They want consistent supply and consistent quality. Credit they are to achieve. If there is a cash payment, they will obviously demand for a discount on that. But, you know, supply to one dealer, yesterday we had Mr. Alok Bhatia telling us about this. One dealer per market and avoid unnecessary competition and please do not send these goods to small retailers directly because that's what is going to supply the uh, supply chain. So coming to the e coms I think we had a big session on e com so I don't want to delve on it in, a, uh, you know, in detail. So we just need to make sure one thing that you know he mentioned about two models, marketplace and inventory model. If you are looking at the inventory model then they expect you to be very good at your OPP which is the opening price point. So opening price point is some, something that you when, when somebody looks at the segment and looks at the particular product, it should be the cheapest. So, you ought to be the cheapest if you want the backing of the platform to really push you and give you some visibility. So, ability to deliver quickly Pan India. Now, this is what I am saying if you want to look at the other way, marketplace, as Rahul mentioned. Ability to invest on visibility, I think this has already been discussed. Ability to provide stable rates for two to three months. I mentioned about a month there, but e coms want a very, very stable pricing. Ability to manage your assortments. Now again, that's the same thing as in the modern retail. Your delivery, you know, this is a quick call. Now they want you to deliver everything in seven days. From the date of PO to the delivery to the fulfillment centers, it has to be within seven days. And the participation in the big million days and all those things are absolutely mandatory for us. We'll have to dole out a lot of things. So how do you bridge the gap? Or what are the gaps? So if you're looking at all these new avenues, I think you really look at long-term relationship with these uh, modern retail or the e-com because of the investment that we are doing in terms of the entry fee and all those shelf spaces that you are going to buy. So there is no flirting around. If you are there, you have to stick around, invest and you know you have to be there for a long time and then only you will see some results coming. So choosing the segment, you should be absolutely right in what segment you are comfortable in. If you look at the general trade, they buy 75% to 80% of your assortments but if you look at the modern retail, they buy only 20-25% of your assortment. If they just go on buying W320s, W400, probably a couple of grades in brokens. But other than that, they wouldn't like to promote the premium, which you know is sort of slow moving items. So there is zero rejection when it comes to a general trade because we negotiate. If there is any issue, we know how we can negotiate and ensure that it's settled and it doesn't come back. But when it comes to a modern or any institution for that matter, the rejection levels are extremely high and one of the biggest challenges is maintaining 5% of the broken conditions that they, have, they insist on. So this is a big challenge now, you know, the several transshipments and reaching it to them, we will discuss that later. Upgrading our facilities, absolutely mandatory uh, requirement now. We have to ensure that the food safety standards are, you know, adhered to. Creating products suitable to each of these segments. We'll delve on it later. Establishing a full placed food safety team is absolutely critical if you're looking at the organized retail segment. So some of the challenges Gunjan has already placed it before you. 
enhanced processing capacity is something that we are all looking at. There's a lot of people who are getting into cash, so the oversupply is going to be there, which is going to bring in some disparity for a while till the balance is uh, you know maintained. So change in consum consumption pattern, again he has mentioned about it. This is a big concern post-COVID. There is absolutely no takers for the premium range and uh, W180s and W240s were literally not selling and people were, uh, you know, it was getting a more into a price sensitive market post-COVID. People were shifting from W320 to W400, W450, anything cheaper than that also would be fine but it became a very price sensitive market. Need for changing the grades, so this is where industry need to, this is a big gap now, four or five decades and we are still doing the same old grades but we need to look at doing something, you know, in just Simple grading terms, premium, standard and popular. Rahul mentioned about what consumer really understand. He doesn't know what is color, finish. They just want to get that feel and crispiness. So dealing with lower grades, now this is another thing. When we saw there is no demand for the higher grades, there is extremely good demand for the lower grades. But with the FSSA Act now getting very active, I think we are in for some trouble that half the grades that we are selling as lower grades will not even qualify the specs of FSSA high. So this is something that we have to be very careful and we have to deal with it and dealing with the begging demand. Now this is something every single buyer in India wants kernels pressed out of Benin. Now I think Benin has already announced that 2024 they are going to ban raw cash exports from there and they are setting up. We had a presentation yesterday too. Whatever it is, our Prime Minister has been asking us vocal for local but certainly in spite of our, our own nuts being very tasty there are hardly any takers, so this is a big gap as far as promoting. It's a, in fact, you know, we've been telling the farmers grow more cashews here, but there are no takers for the Indian cashews in, in the domestic market. This is a serious concern that we must look at. Cashews may not be white, but they're very, very tasty local nuts. So dealing with the new startup ecosystem, I think we'll be discussing that in the next session to come. The funding arrangements that are going to come, burning cash. So how are the MSMEs going to deal with the competitions coming out from these ecosystems. Dealing with risk, risk have always been there, but I am telling you, even the tortoise will have to stretch its neck out if it has to move forward. We have to take those risks, but that is what is absolutely dealing with them is going to be very critical. So the moot question is, if you are able to really bridge this gap that we are uh, you know, looking at from all the different segments, probably we will be able to find the cash in the cash. Thank you very much. So now we'll have Mr. Satish to talk about uh, a new chain that is coming in the cashew industry on the packaging front. I'm terribly happy that I'm getting new friends and through them I'm getting more businesses. So I'm very thankful for Cashew Info for this, uh, for this opportunity which they gave us. So one is, uh, apart from this slide, yesterday I just had some uh, discussion with some of the buyers. One thing they were asking me is whether, how come Banruti can give a very competitive price wherein other uh, uh, other state cashews are much more pricey, I mean expensive. So I just want to share some of the things which uh, I want to tell you about how we are doing it. I mean probably it's a business secret but still I just want to explain how it happens. See, in Banruti, it's like not typical factory style, which, of course, I own a factory and we run as a typical factory style. But in Banruti, it doesn't happen like that. So, we have small clusters of, let's take 50 to 20 people working in one particular area. Like, let's take the day only shelling. So, the family will be only shelling part, the whole street, will, the whole street, like 15 to 20 people will be doing the shelling. Right? So, we don't have any government competences, we don't have any factory. And if the market is down and they don't work. So in a day, it's possible for us in a day, anytime we go to the market, four to five tons of average kernel is available. Any day, any time. So like if you want NW, it's, it's available. So particular people will do particular job. And, and, and in fact, we have a, a set of peeling machines, huge peeling machines are available there. So it's within the two kilometers range. So they will use it. It's like 24 by 7, these machines will be running. So like colors are the same thing. 
So as such, we don't have much investment happening there in that place. So that it's maximum the machines are utilized. And during the season, six seasons, we are factory people, we have to run throughout the year uh, for different reasons, for the back reasons, uh, many things. But whereas Burnley doesn't ha happen like that. So that's why they could do it, the Burbank costing like we do it in let's take 900 to 1000 rupees, that's it. So whereas in I think other places is very expensive. And apart from that, there are many new factories are coming up in Bandruti, like uh, many more like 200 plus packs, big, big factories have come up and Samora has also is coming up in Bandruti. So I just want to do a basic thing about Bandruti before going into the packing and buyer seller uh, discussion. See, in uh, one of the issues which we faced when we uh, send from down south to Delhi, Rajasthan, the pieces percentage was always higher. Even though we don't deal even a single bit of piece while we do the packing, minimum like 5 to 7 percent happens. So how to avoid that? And uh, likewise, there are other issues where there. So one which which we came and we did some research, not me, the group of people did research for the last one year. We started using the plastic containers. Okay, so there are advantages and disadvantages in plastic containers. To explain you, what we did is, we 10 kilo plastic container were filled, okay, and the tins were filled, and we sent it from Chennai to Delhi. I mean, from Bandruti to Delhi. Okay, so the percentage of broken in the plastic containers were less than two percent. Whereas the same thing in the tins, it was nine, almost seven percent. Since we, there are multiple transit points in the thing. It goes from Chennai, then after that maybe goes to Bangalore, then Delhi. It, every time there is a transit and there are broken percentages more. So this plastic containers will avoid that. I can't say avoid, but the percentage will be less. So you can, you can try this. Then, since, see let's take we want to buy you know, thousand tins at a time. Okay, fine. So when it comes to our factory, almost like thousand square feet of space. But at these things, you can put it over there. Occupy only one corner of the area. So it saves space for us. And and in fact what we did is we put and you know, I mean the kernels inside that we sealed it. We put it in the water. One week we put that inside the water. We we just uh, we just tested for a week Besides, any water sweepage is happening there. There is not a single bit happening there. And uh, the moisture was perfect, the taste was perfect. And they and we did for last one year, like every three months, we will be uh, checking the opening the seal, tasting it, tasting the smell. I mean, the, the, we will smell it. And uh, and it is perfect. It's, it's very fresh. It is good. And most important thing is, this is re reusable. Like in our houses, they can use it for any purpose. It's like a bucket sort of thing. So they can keep even rice, pulses, sometimes in the toilet they can use it. Okay, so it's like that. So overall, we, I mean, what, of course the negative point is, it's a plastic, it's, a, it's an environment thing, but it's reusable, reusable. I feel somehow we have to try this maybe 5 kilos, 10 kilos packs, and probably more innovation should come into this. So that next level, some gas filling ha has to happen, or some maybe the ceiling, the way the ceiling could be changed, some space could be uh, saved in that. So probably more innovation should happen. In this. So this is regarding the package, which I just want to talk about. Um, next is this uh, some buyers that are conflicts are there. So I just want to, I just I just collected some information from the uh, seller's point of view. What are the issues they will see? One, I personally, I transported goods from my location uh, to a vendor. <laughs> so they, what they do is, they don't do the testing immediately. They take the, take the sampling, they go to the lab, and by the time the truck, truck guy has to wait there in the, in the factory, or um, I mean the outlet, for almost one, one or two days. So that becomes a problem for us. Same as they will do the quality test in our place and uh, it goes there. After three months, they come back and say there is issue. 
So I would suggest, I mean, there's a, there's a solution for them. I would say that since we know, everybody knows Mangalore, Banduti, in Odisha, they can keep on representing okay. Before backing everything, they can check. They can do all the quality tests. You want to do the lab tests, you do it. Whatever you want to do, do it. Once it is packed and sent it to the, the destination, it's better avoidable to return back to us. So that is just first to the bias who comes with this. I'm, it's over to Mr. Shina Chaudhary at ITC, one of the largest buyer of uh, cashew nuts for the institutional segment. And uh, I mean, I would love to hear what they have for what are the expectations of an end user. Thank you, Gunjanji, for the kind words. Uh, I would like to introduce myself as Shina Chaudhary. Uh, I'm from ITC Foods. Uh, and a quick brief about myself. I've been with ITC Foods since nine years. Uh, I started my journey as a campus recruiter. Uh, I was inducted into cashew commodity in my career. So I share my journey with probably many of the cashew processors here. I visited their factories, learned the commodity and the food area. So currently I had the grains and the dry fruits particular for ITC foods. Uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to thank the organizers to, for giving me this opportunity to uh, share my thoughts with the cashew industry. And uh, quickly jumping into the presentation, I will present my views on you know, the quality and food safety management for the cashew suppliers. And this is mostly with respect to as a buyer's perspective. Uh, as one and all know, uh, cashew is one of the most widely used nuts. That is because one, it is affordable, two, it's tasty and healthy. And thus, we find uh, cashew making its way to multiple applications. So it's, it's used in traditional sweets, it's used in the bakery segment, it's used in the confectionery segment, chocolates, beverages and multiple other applications. We can also find a small demo of the various new and the innovative products that are presented outside. Uh, can we have the next slide please? Uh, as other speakers have already presented, uh, uh, I mean I picked up the statistics from INC. Uh, cashew is one of those nuts which is picking up on a high consumption trend and as others have spoken, uh, India is one of the largest consumers of cashew. We've seen a year on year growth of about 24 percent. Well, this is on the consumption trend. Uh, one thing that we guys need to introspect is our, our manufacturing practice. So, while we are heading and we are the leading consumers of cashew in the world, it's also a time to evaluate our manufacturing practices are compliant to the laid out business standards and this subject is increasingly becoming important as the customer of the consumers today are more conscious and cautious about the dry foods and the food that they buy and they eat and thus it's time to introspect and probably evolve and upgrade our systems. So I would like to briefly present a view of the concerns from the B2B perspective because we've seen other speakers mentioning about b 2 we've heard Prabhuji mentioning about freshness and other attributes that the other potential customers who shop on e-platforms so These are few concerns which I'm trying to portray with respect to what are the problems that we face as you know the end buyers or end users from the B2B side. So these are mainly the problems that we guys as end users in the B2B segment face. Foreign matter contamination and infestation the chat with about 60 to 70 percent problems. Following with another important issue that we are facing in the industry currently that is nuts with high AEF that is acidity of extracted fat and sensory fat. So the reasons for these rejections are mostly centered around few areas. So when we when we have actually gone into the basics and tried understanding what the commodity is and how it's behaving, we see that result of poor quality material at the back end at the processor side is probably one of the reasons why you know there are a lot of issues associated with foreign matter contamination or infestation. In addition to this, there are certain storage practices at the processor's end which are probably leading to issues like cross infestation or probably some issues associated with the unhygienic or less hygienic or uh, processing areas or probably irregular plant fumigation being done. Such small attributes leading to uh, infestation concerns or probably FMC related concerns. Now apart from all of this, when we visit our processors or factories, we do see that all these guys are equipped with best of class facilities. However, there are some things which are getting missed at the end, that is some last minute regular checks. Let's understand how these attributes are actually leading to rejections at the end level. Uh, we have metal detectors installed at every factory. We have probably aspirators mentioned uh, installed in every factory. 
But when we have installed something, it is also the responsibility of our processor to check if these are being fine-tuned at regular points and to ensure if these are working properly at the right time. Because we often face issues associated to metal contamination or probably FMC related issues. But when we actually visit the factory, we realize that metal detectors are installed and everything is in place. But when we actually go and check if they are working or not, to our surprise and to the processor's surprise, we see that the metal detectors are probably not working. So these are probably certain small and minute areas of focus can potentially avoid rejections at the end level. Now while most of the processors are already aware of what is FMC, foreign matter contamination and infestation, I would like to touch upon two aspects which are increasingly gaining importance from the perspective of buyers like say ITC or probably Britannia or Paris. So this is basically nuts with high AEM facility of extracted fat or sensory issues. So the problem that the industry is facing is we do the physical check, we do the chemical check, we do the micro check. But the industry in our opinion is not evolved to check the sensorial parameters. They still lack some sort of an expertise into the organolytics because this is more of subjective and not objective. And thus, I urge all the processors here to invest time get into the subject of organolytics, train their quality personnel and then educate them and train them on getting the right organolytics. This is very important from the perspective of the B2B customers because sensory failure at the end of the day essentially qualifies for a rejection and would get back to a vendor. So proper training or probably proper investment of knowledge into this subject would add great value not only to the end buyer but to the seller as well. There are some other issues that we guys are potentially facing, like what I mean listed here. Something like you know a burnt cashew or a cashew piece with the skin that is coming from normal cut cashew bits or SWPs or a bits. Plus there are certain issues related to vacuum leakages or improper truck hygiene, essentially leading to sensory failure. Say for example, a truck that is probably used for transportation of ginger or onion is probably used for transportation of cashew is probably inducing or inducting that odor into the cashew and probably is impacting the end product. Now apart from this when we guys are buying various grades like say cashew SWPs or LWPs, we often see mix up of certain batches of SWP or LWP with baby beds or probably there is a mismatch in quantity or inconsistent grades coming out into one into other. So certain small uh, changes are probably in the processing areas could probably add value in this case. Now apart from this, uh, we've also heard the speaker from Amazon making a mention about regulatory challenges. So these are similar challenges that we are facing in the industry. While everyone is aware of the regulatory challenges uh, and probably the steps associated with FSSI, uh, FSSI mandates that every processor or manufacturer of food in the country of India has to be compliant on various set standards and he has to ensure that this compliance in place on a bi-annual basis and thus has to submit his samples in an approved NABM lab and has to get a validated report with all compliances and adherences in place. As we heard, this is also uh, increasingly significant in case of Amazon as Amazon is also making a mention explicitly that a sample which is listed along with an NABM accredited lab has to be a Now, one of the challenges that we guys as end users face in this space is, is the industry having 100% complaints, if not, are we compliant to what extent and at which stage are we compliant to what level? Because the, the, the industry per se is to a great extent still in an unorganized manner and as end buyers we still lack that confidence as to what is the level of compliance at which stage in supply chain. And thus, we as end users probably are not having the full confidence in the commodity that we buy. And thus, this particular area still remains great and remains as a big challenge because we do often scan through the various reports that we receive across the commodities that we buy. This is not only specific to cashew per se but the other commodities. We often see a difference or probably a non confidence in certain aspects. While we proactively try taking steps in correcting this, a, a, a greater attention in this area from the processor side will probably add great value of their own enhancement and their own growth. So this is, this is my request to the industry. And that actually brings us to one area and in fact I would like to take this forum and I would request the experts from the industry to probably give it a thought and probably give that some sort of a system 
into the casual business or probably the casual ecosystem. There is a platform where all the processors who are currently operating in the country can be enrolled into it and get some sort of visibility on this conference so that the end users probably you know, can get into it, scan through it, look on the complaints part so that at the end of the day, the traceability part and the complaints part would be given a greater visibility and the end buyer would be having that assurance that yes, the product that I am buying is even from so and so is 100% compliant to the set standards as for the regulatory body and then you know, we can have that assurance in terms of our buyer. So as I as I mentioned, uh, I, I I I've been inducted in this commodity and I've I've grown with cashew. So all my learnings have basically been put into these four different clusters, which if probably addressed, can probably lead to you know a, a, a great uh, enhancement in terms of improvement, and then would essentially help in delivering a quality product. So one area where probably the processors can focus is the raw materials that they buy to process and supply to end users like us and quality management around these areas can potentially add value to the raw material. Further, on the manufacturing practices, there are a list of good manufacturing practices which if probably adhered properly and then ensure that things are in compliance will probably assure and ensure that there are no issues at the end level. And finally, when we have the handling and transportation mode as uh, 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 some other speakers were also mentioning, you know, selecting the right channel of transportation, ensuring that proper trucks are in place would probably help addressing this issue to a greater extent. And finally, the key area which I was trying to mention, regular review. More than 90% of factories or vendors that we are dealing with have all the systems in place. They have all the systems. The only thing is, some frequent checks if the systems are perfectly working or not would actually enhance that accuracy level probably from 90% to probably 96, 97, 98%. That would probably help avoiding rejections in the last minute and then you know avoid the last minute expenses. So with that, uh, this thing I we, we always firmly believe that you know any any small change, any small change that is brought into this entire manufacturing process at any point of time would actually add a significant value to the value chain and then would give and instill that confidence to the end user that look, whatever product that I'm buying from whomsoever is actually coming out with 100% quality. So we believe that small things make a big difference. So with this thought, I would like to wrap up my presentation and uh, hand over this opportunity for any questions. So what are the expectations, so I'm, this I'm generalizing now, what are the expectations of an Indian kernel buyer? What are the challenges as a buyer, whether it's a modern retail buyer, whether it's a general trade buyer, whether it's a quick commerce buyer, the biggest challenge is lack of standardization. All specs, and that goes for the processes themselves. Because of this gap, we are facing quality rejection. We are facing sometimes unnecessary quality rejections. It's getting very subjective. All specs need to be standardized across the industry for our benchmarking. And that this is something I've been saying for a long time that a W320 from any factory has to be the same spec of a W320. So this is the normal thing you get if you are getting a, you know, like a list from anything. You can just go through the array of the 240s or the 320s. We have had to work out a system where uh, the W320 of one factory means a P320 of the other factory and it means a D320 of the other factory. And I've seen across uh, across the same the same seller if they have a unit in Panruti and they have a unit in Mangalore or they have a unit in uh, Andhra, we will see different factories and a unit in uh, Ahmedabad. And I've seen the same factory giving out a different W320 from one unit to the other. Now this is one company, mind you. It's the same company that is supplying. So this is a major factor. If this can be done. This would be the biggest bridge between a buyer and seller expectation. I think it's a big hassle even as a processor. I see it as a processor having an array of 48 different grades. If the industry can move to slightly uh, lower set of uh, you know different uh, grades, that it's only a one W320. That's a suggestion that I would have for the processors and the industry in general. If the industry can work that out, you have a W W320, a W, an A, a P, a D. So, can we have a W320? Rahul ji mentioned what does a customer want at the end of the day. And I keep telling this to my suppliers. What does a customer want? A customer wants a crisp nut, 
a nut without infestation, a nut which is looking okay. I don't think we need that thing which this industry is still hung to. The biggest problem is today it is a lot of time the middleman that is deciding on behalf of the consumer. We take notions that this is what the consumer wants. I think uh, we have to give it to the modern trade and e-commerce. What they have done is they have put the fact that the consumer is starting to decide. The fact that you are able to sell W450's motels that maybe the consumer was not that sensitive on size. So that's something we have to take and see that we don't decide. I think we have to stop with that mentality. There was that narrow lack of Asian paint that was my white or my pink. I think that has to end. It has to be a standardized color. It has to be a grade that can go for all. So these were the suggestions that if we can move to this from an array of 48, 50 different grades, the industry can probably move to that and save a lot on inventory costs and everything. Standardization in terms of weight, uh, you get from some origins, you get 11.340, from some origins you get 10, 22, 6.680. I think that has a lot to do with the previous thing of exports being major, but now that India is a major consumer, I think we have made US suppliers move to 25 kilos. US suppliers now know that India needs 25 kilos. We have made them move from pounds to kilos. So why don't we do it here in our own country? Rates, uh, again, huge, uh, different ways that the rates are set out to a customer. There is a rate for at 22 point, so when the rate is given it for at 22.680, the unit that it will be sold it will be 10 kilos and when it will be big to you it will be on a per kilo basis. So that's a challenge that I think is very easy to solve that why don't we have just one unit a per kilo price. Of course we have seen that change in the industry, it is happening that it has changed but I think uh, we can do a little more on that. So any questions you guys have or any uh, thing from the panelists, we are welcome for that. I just want to respond to one of Kunjan's uh, issue on standardization of grades. What we have to understand is industry does want to have, you know, uh, grades which are simpler in structure than what he just showed. There's no doubt about it. But one must remember that how many origins are we dealing with? We are dealing with seven origins from West Africa, three from East. We are dealing with Indonesia, dealing with eight origins from India. And every single origin has a different in terms of texture, in terms of color, and if, I, if my buyer tells me I want Benini Chai, I can the process kar rahe to. So the point here is, this has come out of necessity and not out of anything else. One, the trading to different kinds of things to meet the customer's need, it has gone into that level. But of course, we also realized value as we did that. But today when we hear buyers themselves say that no, we need to club these grades and bring it into single. I think there has to be an effort, but there has to be a clear understanding that you know a supplier of W320 from one factory and supplier of W320 from another factory, there is bound to be some differential in color, in terms of its texture, but it will be perfect in terms of its specs. So, oh, I am Sashi Shekhar from Nanopix. In continuation to what uh, Kalpavi was mentioning uh, about uh, grades, value from different origin and uh, different uh, 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 methods, I would like to more point out on if a factory which actually takes very high effort to bring the best out of the same raw nut they process, while there is another factory which doesn't bother much about the, much about the quality, both of them producing W320 of the same grade, being treated by the buyer the same value, will it not actually destroy same like giving the same rank to all the children and then seeing if we can all get admission into IIT. Uh, in terms of again, as I said, it's the consumer. What does the consumer want? We have to look at that. And uh, Rahulji displayed that what does the consumer want. It is very specific. They are not so bothered on the exact texture or shade of it. I agree there is one factory doing a better job. That will be visible. That will be visible in the branding they do. But in terms of just having one grade as W3.1, of course, a trader can decide which one he wants to go with. If there is a difference in price, of course, there is a saying, Jitna gur dalo ke utna mitha hoga. So, of course, that will be there. But the most standardized the industry is, it is better for everybody across. You face a lot of rejection on subjective things. All that ends. Prakash sir, it is we only who educated the consumers 
the customers that this is benin so you get better white color nobody no, no trader in khari bawli would even know what tanzania and what benin is it is we only who have educated and created mess for ourselves number one i think it is time for uh, it is time for us to make uh, make a umbrella association so that now uh, you know instead of focusing on exports we should focus more on the domestic market which is about 3.25 lakh tons kind of stuff and uh, an umbrella organization can uh, service all the concerns what you, what what punjan has raised rightfully i mean it's been a wonderful insight uh, but but it's time you know with with fragmented nine associations we can't expect anything to happen on the uh, the promotion side or or probably even on the standardization of uh, this thing so i think uh, one good uh, thing is that we need Uh, to detach ourselves from what Benin is, what Tanzania is, and make a standard, uh, uh, you know, quality uh, spe specification which suits uh, the, the 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 end consumer's uh, expectations. Okay, so I think our time is up. So let's move to the next slide. I just want to leave you with this thought, and we can go. Next slide. That's the wonderful thing. Just yeah, go to the next one. Next slide. That's the thing. You guys are so lucky to be in the industry where uh, the same product holds an enviable place in consumer belief on both the sweet spots of polarity. Normally, what you'll see on the red would not be on the blue. It's only stuff like uh, nuts and dried fruit, cashews. They are nutritious yet they are tasty. Normally, you'll have potato chips, very tasty, packaged, convenient, contemporary, premium. satiating special but they'll not be healthy they'll not be fresh they'll not be natural it's only cashew nuts or other nuts which fall under both the polarities i love using this to say that how lucky we are to be industry that we are in we are at both uh, sweet spots on both the opposite polarities there was so thank you india is a land of opportunities i say it always it is the land of zero but it is also the land of 1. now 1.4 billion people and they await the best of cashews that the cashew world has to offer thank you